Welcome to Lincoln Log, where we speak with leading historians and other officials about their stories, research, and wisdom. Expand your knowledge and indulge your curiosity here on Lincoln Log. This podcast is produced by the Abraham Lincoln Association, aiding and promoting Abraham Lincoln's life and legacy. Founded in 1908, the ALA remains the nation's oldest and largest Lincoln organization. Learn more at abrahamlincolnassociation.org. Greetings. I am your host, Joshua Claiborne, and I am pleased to welcome John White to our Lincoln Log podcast. John is a professor of American Studies at Christopher Newport University. He is the author or editor of more than a dozen books and more than 100 articles, essays, and reviews about the Civil War, including several prominent award-winning books. His newest forthcoming book is a children's book, My Day with Abe Lincoln. I should also note that this is Jonathan's third appearance on the podcast, which pulls him ahead of Alan Gelzo as the most appeared guest on the podcast. John, thanks for joining us. Well, thanks for having me. I may have appeared the most, but I have a feeling Alan has the most views. <laughs> I will say he ha- his his is very, very popular, so we'll probably have to get him back on here soon. But no, you're 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 a, you're frequently you have Jonathan. I've I've said this. You are clearly the uh, most prominent, best up and coming Lincoln slash Civil War historian from my perspective of our generation. I think we're about the same age, and and um, I, I'm confident for decades to come, you're going to be uh, uh, central to the discussion of of Lincoln and the Civil War and and the, their legacy. Okay. Um, so I, again, I'm happy you're here. Uh, Let's start. Let's dig right into this this book. I mean, what was the impetus behind it? What what gave you the idea and the drive to want to delve into a children's book for this? I think it's a couple of things that came together sort of at the same time. I've been studying Lincoln for a long time, did my first Lincoln book in 2011, and have done a lot of Lincoln and Civil War books since then. And at the same time, I had children during that period. So I had a daughter in 2013 and another one in 2016. And there's been a lot of nights where I tell children's stories, you know, either read books to my kids, and we own probably over 100 kids books about Lincoln and the Civil War. But then I would also make up stories about, you know, animals and all sorts of different things. And at some point, I had the idea to sort of bring these two aspects of my life together. The I'm a Lincoln scholar on the one hand, and I'm a dad on the other hand, and try to put together a story about Abraham Lincoln that would be appealing to children. One of the things we often talk about when we go to Lincoln events, like the ALA banquet or other events around the country is, you look around and there's not a lot of young people. And so we're always trying to think about ways to bring in kids and get them interested. So as they get older, they really have a heart for American history and Abraham Lincoln in particular. And so my hope is that this book will be a way to do that. Right. Well, and I I call it a children's book, but I know obviously people try and target even within that genre, certain age groups. So what age groups would you say are best, uh, most appropriate for, for this, for this book? I think the reading level is probably six to nine or six to 10 year olds. A a, a five year old who's a strong reader, I think, would be able to do it, or an older kid who's not a strong reader might find it an appealing read. Okay. Uh, I, I, what I, one thing I really like, because I've, I've got a daughter and a son, and I like sometimes people, uh, there's a big push for, for instance, girls to just read about other uh, famous or notable women and likewise men. And we kind of pigeonholed boys and girls into different genders. And I, I thought your book was totally appropriate and engaging and appealing to my daughter or would be anyway. And so I really appreciate that about the book as well. Well, thanks. And it's funny, I think, so the main character is a third grade girl who travels back in time to meet Abraham Lincoln. And I think in a lot of ways, I, I based her on my kids and some of the experiences we have. And my hope was by having a female character who then encounters Lincoln and his sister, Sarah, it sort of will appeal to all kids. And, and my daughter is in third grade. So that's one reason I'm really excited to get this. Um, I, I want to ask, you know, my sense, and maybe I'm being too cynical, but my sense is so often we're 
reassessing so many of our famous historical figures uh, with a critical eye, which I think is important and valuable. But sometimes I question if we go too far to the point that uh, we ignore important uh, people who have contributed in important ways that can offer a lot of great lessons um, because they said the wrong opinion or or had some view that may have been the norm during their time period, but obviously is no longer in ours now. Uh, Thomas Jefferson, uh, fill in the blank. And unfortunately, we've seen Abraham Lincoln uh, come under some criticism recently as well. Um, I, I don't know if you want to talk about that. And is, is, first, if you have any thoughts, but if there's, I, I, I will tell you that was another thing I thought I liked about this is it, you know, you, you mentioned kids now uh, want to make sure they stay engaged with Lincoln. And I think, uh, to me anyway, that seems important to continue to refresh and engage younger children with with people like Lincoln. Yeah, I'm a native Pennsylvanian, and this morning I saw on Twitter that the National Park Service is taking the statue of William Penn down in Philadelphia, which is just insane to me. I just I I would say add more statues yeah. to the Welcome Park rather than take them down. And my approach is the same with Lincoln. I opened up my book, A House Built by Slaves by talking about this sort of modern moment we're in where people want to take down Lincoln's statue or change the name of schools that are named after him. And they they do it because they have a, I, I think, a very out of context view of what Lincoln did. And they, you know, they cherry pick a quote or they look at one aspect of his presidency without understanding the broader political constraints in which he was working. And when we do that, we then misunderstand how great someone like Lincoln was. And so, yeah, in my scholarship for adults, I try to help us recapture who Lincoln was and what he did and where he deserves criticism. I think I've criticized Lincoln in some of my books on the civil liberties issue, which I've written a couple books about. I, I, I think I, um, take some, I, I don't want to say take some shots, but I, I, uh, I make some critiques, but at the same time, we have to understand that he was someone who accomplished some great things that his other contemporaries weren't able to accomplish. And, and I think we should appreciate him for that. So right. my hope is that a book like this will help begin to instill that sort of appreciation in young readers. Right. Well, I think we, we, we touched on this the last time you were on the show, but given this topic of your book, I think it's worth discussing again, and that was how you developed your own interest in the Civil War era, Abraham Lincoln, um, and how what lessons you might draw from how you got hooked, how you got interested, how that could uh, help others ensure their own youngsters or other kids they know are able to get engaged as well. I think a lot of it has to do with really good storytelling. So I grew up in a house outside of Philadelphia that was the original part of it was built in the 1720s. And when I was a kid, I found the old trash pit out back and I would just dig up things. And the stuff of history is what first captured my attention. But then I, my dad was a history major and my grandfather loved history. And I have memories of my dad taking me to places and my, my parents both together taking me to historic sites or Gettysburg and learning those stories. And then my grandfather telling family stories and Hearing stories is what gave me a real connection to the past. And so that's what I try to do with my kids is tell them good stories or read them good books and, and catch their interest that way. Well, back, back, I guess back to the, the, my day with Lincoln, I mean, you uh, mentioned that, you know, it is a third grade girl who goes back in time. Um, I like how you've divided this into the different chapters and you, you do such a good job of storytelling based around different incidents. Um, I don't know if there's one that you want to uh, summarize just to kind of give a sense of what the book is about for those that are uh, listening and thinking about buying it. You know, what what can they expect as 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 you know she travels back in time with sure. Lincoln? So the the book opens with this character Lucy not wanting to go to school on a Monday morning, and it's a Monday morning right now. And I can tell you, I experienced this a couple of hours ago where one of my daughters just didn't want to get out of bed and go to school, and so in the story she puts on this crazy outfit that you can see pictured here because she thinks maybe if I dress really silly, my parents won't let me go. And to top it off, she puts on her brother's magic hat 
And when she puts on the hat, she goes back in time. And what she finds out at the end, she doesn't know this, is that her mission in the story is to give Abraham Lincoln this top hat. And so that it sort of gives us a, a new twist on the picture of Abe Lincoln wearing the stovepipe hat. And she then spends the entire day with Abe and Sarah Lincoln. She's in Indiana in the 1820s. And as she goes throughout the day, she learns all of these incredible stories about what Abraham Lincoln's childhood was like. And right. what I like to tell people is that every aspect of this story is historically true, except for the time travel part. And so as many of your viewers and listeners may know, I in October, I published the abridged version of Michael Burlingame's Green Monster. So Michael has the massive two-volume biography of Abraham Lincoln, and Johns Hopkins University Press wanted him to turn it into an abridged edition, and Michael asked me to do that. And so I spent about two and a half years abridging that book. And as I did that, I was pulling out all these incredible stories from Lincoln's life, and I thought, okay, this will go in a house built by slaves, or this will go in my book Shipwrecked. And then I also at that time had the idea of I wanted to do a kid's book. And so mm -hmm. as I was reading about Lincoln's early life, I was thinking, oh, this will go into that story. Yeah. And uh, Some of the ones that I think are most interesting that people in the Lincoln world know, but a lot of people outside of the Lincoln world don't know, is how many times Lincoln almost died as a child. Yeah. And so Lincoln almost drowned when he was a kid in Kentucky and his friend Austin Gallagher pulled him out of Knob Creek. On another occasion, when Lincoln was about 10 years old, he was kicked in the head by a horse. And in Lincoln's words, he said almost killed for a time. Uh, and, and so those are stories that this character Lucy learns as she goes through the day with Abraham Lincoln. Yeah, yeah. I, I should have mentioned this at the beginning, John, but what, what is the... Uh the official release date uh, of the book or we, we obviously we can pre-order it now, but what's the order? It's time? available for pre-order now. The official release date's February 1st. So okay. it'll come out just in time for Lincoln's birthday and president's day. Perfect. Perfect. Yep. Um, yeah. I'm really excited about that. I, you know, one other interesting thing, I mean, there is a chapter on um, uh, Abraham's father, uh, Thomas, where they meet in chapter seven. Um, you know, you, you do a good job of characterizing how Thomas wanted Lincoln to focus on his, uh, you, you know, having to earn a living with his hands, uh, go out and, and, and farm, do things around. Don't don't just waste in his eyes, probably waste your eye, waste your time reading. Uh, there has been some reassessment a little bit about Thomas Lincoln contextualizing him relative to other fathers at the time. So I'm curious. uh your take on Thomas Lincoln and how or if that's evolved at all over time. Yeah, I think Thomas was probably the hardest character for me to write because I think, you know, Lincoln described him as as being literally without education. And in Herndon's informants, there's someone who calls him a plain, unpretending, plodding man. And we know that there was a lot of tension at different points between Thomas and young Abraham Lincoln. I mean, stories survive about Thomas giving him very se severe beatings, which I don't include in the book. And then, of course, when Thomas is dying, there's correspondence between Lincoln and his stepbrother, John D. Johnston, where Johnston is saying, you know, aren't you going to go visit dad? And Abraham writes back and says, I think it would be more painful for everyone if if I did. And so Lincoln doesn't go see his father before he dies. Yeah. And if, from what we can gather, it, Thomas did not uh, value the idea of education, thought Lincoln was lazy for wanting to read instead of work hard in the fields. And I think Lincoln resented the treatment he got from his father. And in a lot of ways, Lincoln as a father then is the exact opposite. And the stories that survive about how Lincoln would never punish his kids. And Billy Herndon said if they went to the bathroom on the table in the Lincoln Law Office, Lincoln would have laughed and called it smart. I mean, Lincoln had a very different, yeah. different approach to parenting from, uh, from what his father's was. And so all that to say... I tried to capture a sense of that where Thomas doesn't value education and reading and and looks down on a young Abe for wanting to gain an education. But I also didn't want to capture quite how harsh I think it it might have been between the two of them. So I get a little bit of Thomas's character, but probably not all of it in the book. One of the other aspects of 
Lincoln's uh, background that I like you addressed was his grandfather, Abraham, and his uh, interactions with Native Americans, because that's that's something else when I go around and speak with groups, I'm surprised at the number of people who don't know that story, because uh, I, I think it's a fascinating one that un unquestionably left an impact on the entire family. Uh, I don't know if you want to chat about that and how the, uh, you know, how the, how Lucy, who's the character in the book, navigates that. Yeah. So in, in the book I have after dinner, she goes back, she goes to school throughout the day with Abe and Sarah, then goes back to the cabin. They have dinner. And I should say the meal and everything was based on what Michael Burlingame writes about in, in the green monster. And then after dinner, they go outside and they sit by the fire and the children ask Thomas to tell the story of his dad, Captain Abraham Lincoln. And the story, which comes down through a number of sources is that when Thomas was a young boy, they were out in the fields clear in Virginia clearing, or sorry, in Kentucky clearing uh, a farm and a Shawnee warrior comes and shoots and kills Abraham Lincoln or Abraham Lincoln's grandfather, Captain Abraham Lincoln, and then goes to run and pick up Thomas Lincoln, who was six or eight years old at the time. And Thomas's older brother, Mordecai, who is about 15, shoots and kills the Native American warrior. And we've got all sorts of accounts that survive that describe the Native American, what he was wearing. He was wearing a, a silver half moon trinket on his chest. And Mordecai allegedly aimed his, his gun at that and shot and killed him. And this story was something that young Abe Lincoln would have heard many times as a child. We get the sense that Thomas Lincoln loved to tell the story. And... It, it's interesting because Lincoln has a very conflicted legacy when it comes to Native Americans. It, it's interesting. When Lincoln was a, a young man, he fought in the Black Hawk War, so he fought against Native Americans. But then there's a story that survives about a young, uh, sorry, an elderly Indian man who came into camp and the other soldiers wanted to kill him or beat him up. And Lincoln stopped them and said, no, you won't do that. It wouldn't be right. And then as president, Lincoln presides over the largest mass single day mass execution in American history. When on December 26, 1862, he allows 38 Dakota warriors to be executed in Mankato, Minnesota. At the same time, it's the largest mass commutation in American history. He right. sentences of 260 some. And so there's a very conflicted legacy in Lincoln's life about Native Americans and it all starts with this story that Lincoln heard about his grandfather. And one of the things I did with this book is I created a teacher's guide, a curriculum guide, because my hope is that parents and teachers will read this and use it in classrooms. And I wanted to give the teachers and the parents the backstory behind each one of the anecdotes that I tell in the book. So in the book, I limit it to telling the story of the grandfather, but in the teacher's guide, I give more of a background of all these other things that happened during Lincoln's life so that if teachers want to try to tease these stories out with, with their students, they can. And I, in a sense, I give the teachers and the parents the opportunity to become the experts for what goes on in this story. So then when their students ask or their kids ask questions, they are ready with answers. I think that's a, I'm glad you brought that up because I think it's a critical benefit to this book. I mean, uh, and one of the reasons I was thinking not only was am I looking forward to reading it to my daughter, but, uh, you know, frankly, trying to push it on the schools is something uh, to offer and teach as well, elementary schools in particular. Uh, I, I think there's, you know, th th this book is invaluable and you offer the resources and guides for teachers and others to use it, whether whether you're in a public, private or homeschool environment, I think it would work, um, work regardless. So, um, you know, I, I guess for the benefit of all, not, not just parents and others, but um, one thing I think that shines through nicely here too is the close relationship between Abraham and his sister. Uh, you know, he did experience so much loss in his life, in both his mother and his sister, mm -hmm. uh, uh, both, you know, back to back. And um, I don't know if you want to touch on that again for, for listeners who, because I, I think so often we have people who, focus on Lincoln's uh, presidential years and often look over uh, the gl gloss over the Illinois and Indiana years and the importance that that had in shaping who he was. Yeah. And your work has been instrumental in bringing that back to life for, for people as well. What you and Bill Bartelt have done. 
I wanted to, I, I had to think about the number of characters I would have in the story. The story evolved over time. And initially I was thinking about doing a picture book. And, but as, as I began writing, I realized I wanted to tell more in it and make it more of a chapter book. And I had to decide how many characters I would have. And of course the Lincoln family household had three stepchildren in there as well, plus cousins who, who live there as well, the Hankses. And so I needed to figure out who can I include and what would be too many. And I decided to leave out the cousins and the, the step siblings and mainly focus on Abe and Sarah. And we know that they, they had a close relationship and part of it is rooted in the fact that they're, they're growing up together in the wilderness. And I often think about, you know, when, when Nancy Lincoln died and Thomas went back to Kentucky to find a, a new wife He's gone for, I think, about six months. I mean, it's, it's a right. number of months. And he was gone for about twice as long as they expected him to be gone. And so there you have Abe and Sarah with their cousin living in the middle of nowhere, having to take care of themselves. And you, you have to imagine that they grew very close in that sort of environment. And I wanted to capture that sort of sibling relationship when they're in their teen years or so and they're getting they're going off to school. And, you know, as you mentioned, very sadly, Sarah would die in childbirth when she was about 21 years old. And the stories that come down is that Abe was completely heartbroken and, and grief stricken as a result of losing his sister and really resented Sarah's husband. He hated the grief squeeze anyway, but resented her husband and blamed him for her death. So right. I wanted to capture that that close friendship between these two. And then I use that friendship as a way of bringing out some stories through their dialogue, where Sarah tells stories about Abe's childhood and some real quotes from Abraham Lincoln's life come out in their in their conversation. Right. I will tell you, I don't know how maybe a year or so ago, I spoke before the National Association of Grigsby Family Descendants. Mm. And uh, needless to say, they have differing opinions on the Grigsby family but uh but yeah it's certainly a a, a controversial uh, a complicated and strained one no doubt between between the two I had um, no idea there was a national association of descendants no, they are very very active too they 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 do a lot of genealogical work publishing and it's yeah it's quite interesting so they probably don't great. like the parodies that Lincoln wrote oh no no. <laughs> no um yeah, and I, you know, th there is so much there too. I I think for kids to appreciate and and wonder at Lincoln's youth because of the hardship, the troubles he had to go through. Uh, you know, even I think of uh, you know, the flatboat trip he went on while still in Indiana to New Orleans. I mean, I always challenge adults too. Like, imagine sending your own kids on that kind of task at at this age. Even with modern cell phones, you wouldn't do that. You know, back then when it was you had you had river pirates. You certainly weren't going to that. That was that would be even a bigger uh, undertaking as well. Um, so I you know I think the other thing too is you know I what I often tell people is imagine imagine your own life from age seven to twenty one and how important and critical those years were to shaping who you are. Uh, so too it was with Lincoln. So undoubtedly a, an important time. Um, my well, hope is that young readers will see some of the struggles that Lincoln overcame and that it can be encouraging to them. So one of the big themes that comes out in the book is that Lincoln was actually a really bad speller for his entire life. And it's interesting. Last week, I went on to the ALA's Collected Works of Abraham Lincoln, and I just searched for the word very. And he misspelled very at least 40 times in the collected works. He would spell it V-E-R-R-Y. Uh -huh. And that's a theme throughout the book where Lincoln is constantly misspelling things. And if you read Lincoln as an adult, he's there's so many misspellings in his in his uh, writings. And I want kids to realize, you know, my kids have spelling tests every Friday. I want kids to realize, you know, you struggle with spelling, you struggle with learning, so did Abraham Lincoln. And yet look at what he became. Yeah. And, and we consider him one of the most eloquent leaders of all time. Right. Yeah. So the fact that he couldn't spell. Yeah, that that says a lot. So, um, well, you, you've really done a masterful job in terms of uh, bringing Abraham Lincoln uh, to life. As you talk about storytelling is so critical. And I think this does a good job 
of, of doing that with, with wonderful uh, illustrations that bring that to life. Well, thanks. And I should say it was a student from Christopher Newport University who did the illustrations for the oh, book. Oh, that's great. Yeah, great. Yeah, she, so I, I, last year I went to the art program here and I went to the chair of the art department. I said, can you help me find a student who could illustrate it? And she went to the visual arts professors and they found Maddie and I was able to get a grant through our office for undergraduate research to support her in the work last summer. So she did about 60 drawings for the book. And that's I just wonderful. Yeah, no, that's a that's great to know, too. Yeah. Um, everything about it is great. It's a it's a great gift. I'm, I'm, I'm confident it's uh, it's going to do well. Um, I don't know, Jonathan, if, there, if we want to end on any uh, particular good anecdotes we haven't already just talked about that might be of interest to readers in terms of what they'll experience in the book or Lincoln's life in general you want to share? Yeah, I think, you know, the, for for listeners of this podcast who read a lot of Lincoln books, I think there will be a lot in there that is familiar. But my hope is that it'll be a way to share the story with with young kids. So for your children or your grandchildren or your nieces or nephews, my hope is it'll be a great gift for them. And, you know, one of my favorite stories in the book is the spelling bee story with Anna Roby, where one day in school, they, the kids had some sort of spelling bee and the teacher, Andrew Crawford says, you know, he's giving them words and the kids are getting them wrong. And finally he says, you know, there's going to be another word. And if, if you don't get it right, you're going to have to stay here all night. And the word went to a student named Anna Roby, and Anna's word was defied. And she kept spelling it D-E-F-Y-E-D. -E and we know this from Herndon's informants, because Anna told the story much later in life. And she's getting the word wrong and getting really flustered and finally looks over at the window and there's Abraham Lincoln pointing at his eye. And she figures out that it's D E F. I E D and she gets it. She finally gets it right. And I love that story because it, it's just so fun. I think for students, for kids today to see. And, and what we, what I do in the book is I juxtapose that sort of 19th century one room schoolhouse with what a school is like today. And uh -huh. my hope is that it'll be fun for kids to, to see these sort of aspects of Lincoln's life and then be able to think about how different their experiences are today. Today, you'd never have a teacher saying, you're going to have to stay all night yeah. <laughs> if you don't get your assignment right. And if, right. if you think about it, that would have been more of a punishment for the teacher than for the students, I Absolutely. think. Absolutely, yeah. In yeah. the 1820s. Well, I guess I do have one other question before we go. I mean, you, you are so active and productive. Uh, what's next for you? What are your next big projects that you'd like to give us a hint of what's in store for you? Well, I'm working on book two for the children's book. I... I'm in talks with the publisher about what it'll look like, but I, I want to have it set with Lincoln in the White House, and I've written a draft of it already. The In book two, as I envision it, she goes back to uh, August 4th, 1861, and she winds up in the Lincoln bedroom, which was Lincoln's White House at the time or sorry, Lincoln's White House office at the time. And when she sees Lincoln, she knows instantly who he is. But he looks at her and he knows he's seen her before, but he can't quite put his finger on it because she's only aged about six months, but he's aged about 40 years. And so in book two, she spends the day playing with Willie and Tad and seeing some really interesting moments at the beginning of the Civil War. And then the other project I'm working on is actually a project with a student of mine here at Christopher Newport. We are editing the diary of a soldier who fought in the Dakota War in Minnesota in 1862. Okay. And then he became an officer in the 68th US Colored Infantry at the for the second half of the Civil War. And it's been through peer review with UVA Press. And we are now just sort of doing the finishing touches on that book and we hope to get it back to UVA by uh, March. Okay. So those are two big projects I'm working on now. Wonderful. Well, I, I all of it is uh, sounds exciting. I'm looking forward to it, but again, the most immediate one that comes out here February 1st, My Day with Abe Lincoln. Uh, highly recommend it to anyone that has youngsters or works with youngsters or knows youngsters. Um, a, a, a great purchase uh, with great guides to go along with it, too. Thank you, Jonathan, for joining us. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you for listening to Lincoln Log. 
You can subscribe to the podcast in iTunes, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. And if you like this podcast, please consider rating it on iTunes and leaving a review. This helps other people find the show.